guys. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe the excitement that we have. We just ended our video recording with the incredible Greg and Dana Newkirk. And oh my gosh, are we so excited for you to listen to this episode. Ugh. We've referenced them countless number of times. We included them as part of our fall tour. We are, I think we can say obsessed. Say obsessed the Greg and Dana Newkirk. They're paranormal investigators. They're collectors and curators of haunted objects and historical antiquities relating to the macabre and the paranormal. And they are just, they're just like the coolest people we've ever met. They're so, so cool. They also joined us on our very first paranormal investigation at the Conjuring House. So if you did see us on tour, you heard us reference them so many times. You've heard us cover the Crying Boy painting. You've heard us cover the Crone of Catskills, Billy the Idol. These are all objects that Greg and Dana have encountered or possess or possessed. I found myself the entire episode like looking at them and being like, how do I either spend a day being them or have them adopt me? I know. It's funny because we've spent time with them. We feel like we're on a friend level, but I feel like the friendship is unequal still because we're still just like constantly in awe of them and all of yeah. the knowledge that they bring. And they're just, they're the type of investigators that we look up to because of what they bring to investigations. They bring a lot of respect and curiosity and they're the first people to say, well, we don't know everything. And it's a right. really refreshing perspective. And they're people that we like to follow their journey. We're patrons of their Patreon. We listen to their podcast, the Haunted Objects mm -hmm. podcast. And we're going to go on more ghost adventures with them. Yeah, we are. So we really hope you enjoy this episode, Haunted with Greg and Dana Newkirk. It is full of terrifying stories and just really, really beautiful perspectives on the paranormal. We just got our very first haunted object sent to us in the mail. Oh my, what, what is it? It's a, pendulum it's a pendulum that was purchased in Ohio and it has a trickster spirit attached to it. I did not ask for haunted things. That's <laughs> I did. I will say that you two have very much inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> Enabled. Maybe in a dangerous way. Yeah. <laughs> like what path have you set me down? I don't know, but. People say that a lot. They definitely do. <laughs> I, I like to think of us as enablers more than anything else. You so are. <laughs> happy to do it. Happy to be it for you. We know where you live. So if we get anything too <laughs> exactly. weird, you're going to get it. Anytime. I do need to ask both of you because we were not able to see your show, mm -hmm. but we heard you were creating a haunted painting. <laughs> Did it work? Too well. <laughs> Tell us. So it start, we have this joke now. It's like not a joke, but it is kind of a joke. The second we got home from the tour and the painting came back into the house, People started to see a fleshy, a fleshy blob in our house that was very low to the ground. Isn't this painting supposed to be of you, Greg? Well, here's the thing. I think it's like I think it's it growing is. into it's it. growing into me. There's a there's a little egg Gregor running around the yeah. house, like mutating. It's a fleshy blob that's kind of human shaped. So the whole point of the show, we kind of base the show like the beginning and ending was about the the crying boy paintings. I'm sure you guys are familiar. And yeah, about yeah. how the curse started and how they broke it. And it, the whole show is just kind of like our take on how haunted objects happen. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we say, you want to know how they broke the curse of the crying boy is they simply just did their own magic spell. They mm -hmm. burned them all. And we gave people the option at the end. I said, listen, I have always had a thing for crying boy paintings. I think they're the creepiest, weirdest thing. And I always wished I was one. So I commissioned <laughs> a crying boy painting of myself. Incredible. And then when the show is over, they pull the thing off of it. And then in the lobby, everyone gets to go in and dump a bad feeling that they don't want around anymore into the painting to wow. help us haunt it. And it got real fucked up. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so what was the thought behind doing a bad feeling? Because couldn't you put good feelings into it too and still create a haunting? You mm -hmm. could. You could. Mm -hmm. The reason is, what we talk about on the tour is, people ask us, you know, where do you get your haunted objects? And 
no one ever sends us, you know, you don't send somebody one that feels good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's a family heirloom. Sure. Yeah. That's very rare that anyone sends us something nice. It's always yeah. something yeah, yeah, yeah. terrifying. The bell that, you know, your grandma rang for yeah. dinner, like yeah. it has good vibes. It Maybe it brings grandma mm. around. Mm-hmm. You feel her. It's not something that scares you. We only get the shit that scares people. Well, I guess, yeah. Point being, I was like, oh, we have a haunted object. If we get anything bad, I'll send it to you. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> Which is fine. That comes with the gig. Yeah. <laughs> One of the biggest things that we do, I'd say 90% of the stuff that people give to us is something that they have a bad feeling attached to. Something that makes sure. them think of a moment in time or a situation or a trauma they've experienced. They put it on an object. They've haunted that object. And by giving it to us, they are able to put it out of their mind. We put it on a shelf. It might not do anything for us, but for them, they have put that feeling they've imbued it into something they've given it away and they don't have to think about it Mm -hmm. so we just invited people at the end to do the same thing if there's something they've been carrying around with them that they don't want anymore they want to stop thinking about put it in that painting we'll put it on a shelf like we do for so many other people and then we'll see what happens (laughs) do you two ever like pause look at each other and say why are we doing this (laughs) all the time All constantly. The time. <laughs> That's the thing. It's a slow slide yeah. into <laughs> absurdity. <laughs> exactly. And before you know it, you can't relate. I have to say, and I've been in love with this story ever since we were at the Conjuring House and you told us how you two met. So can you tell everyone your love story and can we make it into a movie? Because it is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. How did we meet, Dana? So many, many moons ago, back, I always tell people back in the, you'll know if, if you're familiar with the GeoCities days, there were like free websites that you could build like in the early 2000s, late 90s. Greg and I ran uh, rival ghost hunting websites, ghost hunting teams. I'm <laughs> we Canadian. We didn't start as rivals. Oh yeah, we didn't. So we were, we were friends in the beginning. Uh, I'm Canadian. Greg is obviously American. And I was with a group of uh, all girls. And so we kind of found some synergy there. And at the time, there weren't a lot of people our age doing this kind of stuff. Like it was a lot of older people. And so we kind of gravitated towards each other because we found sort of common. How old were you both? I was 20. And I was 16. Yeah. Yeah. So 15 or 16. Well, then I would have been 19. Yeah, Yeah, about 19. Okay. And so that's how we started. We started as friends and we would sort of share uh, techniques and all that kind of good stuff. And then (laughs) this tells you how great that me and my friends are all boy team did with girls is they said, Hey, we want to come down and ghost hunt with you guys for a weekend. And we all went, well, girls, what are we going to do? And we all use the same excuse without realizing it. Every single one of them had the exact same excuse. And it was that one of their grandparents died that weekend. <laughs> Are you kidding And we were like, me? is there something in the water in Troy, Pennsylvania, that's like killing off everyone's grandparents? Because why is it four dudes telling us their grandmothers died this weekend? Oh they, I guess they didn't sync up. You guys didn't like, no. they, you didn't clear it with each other. Everyone's like, I'm not, I'm not hanging out with them. I'm not staying, they're not staying with me. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning yeah. of our rivalry. And it really, like, I'll be very honest. I can be incredibly honest about it now. <laughs> it was, I knew that Dana and I had a forbidden love. <laughs> I, well, she didn't, but I did. Yeah, D- Dana did not know this. I had the biggest crush on her. <laughs> and she had a boyfriend. I'm a little bit older. And, she, and at that point, like, you know, three, four year age difference yeah. is a much bigger deal. Yes. And yeah. so I was like, I feel so strongly about her. I'm going to turn that, that strong feeling into another strong feeling called <laughs> hatred. Hate. <laughs> <laughs> and I just sort of like pushed them away. And then they got a TV show and me and my friends got butt hurt about it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then um, we still watched it. I mean, the, the lengths I had to go to, you know, torrent Canadian, Canadian television. television to see <laughs> this. You were the only person <laughs> doing that, I promise. <laughs> then I felt so bad because... I was getting ready to move from the East Coast to Seattle, and I was like, man, I really feel bad about how that ended. I need to make up with Dana before I leave. And I emailed, and I tried finding phone numbers, and I tried social media. I could get no response. And the last line of action was, I realized this is creepy in hindsight. I just rented a car, and I drove to Canada, and I knew what town her and her friends were from. It's a city. It's not a city. (laughs) Second largest city in Ontario. (laughs) And I just started asking around. And within 45 minutes, I was on the phone with Dana. I found one of the girls Mm -hmm. uh, at her job. 
And um, we went on a ghost hunt that night. And it was the rest was history. Now we're married. Now we're married. It's a light level of stalking that <laughs> ends really beautifully. It so is. it's okay. Yeah. She made us pick her up and drop her off like four blocks from where she actually yeah. lived. <laughs> Just in case. Dana, as you should when I know, someone I know. who was your enemy arrives yeah. to a large city and finds mm-hmm. you within 45 minutes. I know. And I, we were, my <laughs> friends and I were like, we're doing this as a group. We're going to send them off the trail. And we, we, yeah, we told them to drop us off like blocks away from where we live so they wouldn't know. But eventually he wore me down. Oh, stop. <laughs> Wore you down. And now, yeah, now we're yeah. married. You guys are the enemies to lovers arc. That's like exactly. the, one of the best book genres. It's the best. Yeah. <laughs> and you collect haunted objects. Like, it is the most amazing <laughs> story. I love it. So how did you guys go from being in ghost hunting groups to collecting all of these haunted objects and at one point taking them all on the road for people to interact with. (laughs) Complete accident. It it was absolutely by accident. And I think that it's probably something that most people who are interested in the paranormal on that level where they're kind of going out and investigating, it's likely that you're the weirdo of your friend group, which is always, we say weirdo lovingly, obviously. Yeah, uh, term of endearment. Yeah, people would, they knew that we uh, kind of separately and together were into this kind of stuff. So it started with just people going, this is a weird thing. Do you want this? And, and the collection just sort of, it really was a natural thing. It wasn't mm-hmm. intentional. It was just sort mm-hmm. of like with you guys, someone sending you something, people giving you things. And it started that way. And then it, now at this point, it really, one of the things we talk about a lot is it really feels as if the museum's just sort of building itself. It, it just naturally kind of organically becoming a thing. Yeah. Right. And then one day we got jobs in Cincinnati mm-hmm. where we still live like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And they got a booth to promote the company we worked for. It's a company called Road Trippers. And we liked them a lot because they help you plan road trips that are mm-hmm. outside of like, you don't want to stop at like chain restaurants. You want mom and pops and stuff like that. Weird stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we were their weird beat, you yeah. know, where you want to see a stain of a corpse. We're, yes. <laughs> we'll tell you where to go. It you want to see, you know, a UFO landing site. Here you go. All very much in our wheelhouse. Like just, mm-hmm. yeah. If you want to go to places where Bigfoot is supposed to be, we would write articles about all of these really cool, weird places in America that you can go and travel. That's incredible. It was so much fun. And we, we got to, just talk about weird things all day and write about weird things all day. And they, like you said, they got a booth at an event and we didn't really know what to do. So we kind of just thought, all right, well, let's just bring some of this stuff with us and see if people are interested in it. And it ended up being really popular. And because of that also, then tons and tons of new artifacts would come in. And and so again, it was sort of the accidental beginning of something as if it was just sort of deciding, all right, well, I'm going to build myself now. So I guess this is how I'm going to do it. Right. The the museum itself, you know, we never planned on doing anything like that. Like that was never our wheelhouse. We never sought out to start a collection. But the artifacts planned it. Well, sort of. Yeah. You're at their whim. (laughs) When we (laughs) The thing that we realized when we did that first event, we were the, the traveling museum of the macabre was the original name because it wasn't like haunted objects. It was just weird stuff from different places that were attached to road trips you could take, right? And there was like Plank from Amityville, which is haunted. There was stuff like that. We Mm -hmm. realized no one got to have one-on-one experiences with this stuff. Anytime anyone encountered this, it was in a museum where it was like in a ring of salt and it was evil and you couldn't touch it and be careful, you'll be cursed. And we we never really bought that. Mm -hmm. And we just were like, we want people to have an experience. Yeah, touch the stuff, handle it. Tell Mm -hmm. us what you feel. Right. And when we realized how much people wanted that experience, we were like, well, let's do this for real. Mm-hmm. And now it is what it is. It's so cool. And we've covered a couple of different things that you have yeah. in your possession or have had in your possession on the podcast. But when we were at the Conjuring House, you know, there were multiple times where there was downtime. Uh-huh. One of my most fond memories is also probably the most terrified I felt the entire time we were in the Conjuring <laughs> House. But we were all in the basement and it was approaching midnight. And after we had heard that EVP about death at midnight, I was like panicked. (laughs) But you two were telling us some of the most terrifying but fascinating stories. And some of them you were like, well, we can't really share this anywhere. So basically, we want to take this opportunity to have you share the ones that you can share. Sure. Because there was that one, you were explaining a story about someone had reached out to you about an artifact that they found like in the woods Mm. and you met in like a school at a school or something is this ringing a bell Mm -hmm. can you tell that 
Are you allowed to talk about this one? Yeah. I can share some details from that story. Okay. There's new developments That's that a, are yeah. very disturbing. Oh. <laughs> Recent new developments. Recent. Yeah. And I, I won't get into those yet, but basically there was a guy who was reaching out to us. I mean, it had been at least a year we'd been talking and he had an item that he had made himself and he was influenced to build this thing by something, a voice that spoke to him in the head, in his head when mm -hmm. he went to a certain part of the woods near him. Mm -hmm. We were constantly saying like, listen, you know, if this thing is, is making you feel like uncomfortable or you feel it's dangerous or you don't like how you feel around it, you can send it to us. We'll take it off your hands. You know, if it does weird stuff, we'll keep you uh, abreast on it. But he was too scared to send it through the mail because he was afraid that anyone who handled that mail would have some sort of an accident or something. He was really scared of this thing. Yeah. About a year after we started talking about this, we were doing an event in Chicago as a Chicago ghost conference. And <laughs> to give you the full story, I have to give you another piece of this story, mm -hmm. but I promise it, it'll tie in. Okay. We have the booth set up. We're having a great time. And then a woman walks in and I, the, all the blood drains out of my face because it's a woman who I had just had an a online argument with <laughs> several days beforehand. And this is Chicago. She was from Seattle. And I'm like, what in the world is this person doing here? She had come to just coincidentally to Chicago, realized that we had been in this argument, came to the event to argue with me in person. <laughs> to prove me wrong because she was right. She we, was right. We were arguing about the oldest occult shop in Chicago and I'd lived there for <laughs> a few years and there's a place called the Occult Bookstore. Cool, super cool place. We used to hang out there all the time who uh, proclaimed to be the oldest occult shop in Chicago. This woman said, they're not, it's Athena Candle Company. And I said, well, I don't think, think you're wrong. I don't know why these people would lie about it. I think it's just a confusion. She came to prove it and then she said, while she was there, and I agreed, I was like, you're right, you're right. She said, you know what? I think you need to go to Athena Candles. There's something coming. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> and she's like, what a turn. <laughs> In the morning, before you go back, come with me to the shop. I used to work there. I'll give you a tour. Next morning, we meet her there. She grabs me by the arm, runs me around the room, grabbing like all kinds of blessed metals, holy water, salves, you rub on your feet, like all kinds of stuff. And he's saying, I think you need this and you need this, you need this. Necklaces, giving Dana necklaces, bracelets, all this stuff. And I'm thinking like, this is going to be expensive. <laughs> like, <laughs> we just got scammed into coming to this place and spending all kinds of money. And then she says, it's, this is not enough. She takes us into the back of the building where two magic practitioners give us a blessing. And it was beautiful. And I can remember how just unbelievable, whatever sort of incense they were using, it smelled incredible. Like I'd never smelled it before. And then she was like, okay, I think you're good. And she left. I looked at Dana. I'm like, what the heck was that about? Mm -hmm. On the drive home, I get a message from that guy we had talked to a year before. And he said, okay, this is your chance. I see that you guys are in Chicago. You're going to come right through where I live. You either come pick this thing up from me tonight or I'm throwing it in the river. And I'm like, don't wow. do that. Don't do that. That's fine. We can be there, but it's going to be like middle of the night, like midnight, one o'clock by the time we get there. Yeah. He's like, that's fine. I'm an overnight janitor at a high school. Just meet me at the high school and I'll tell you about it and we can do the drop off there. What we didn't realize at the time was this is in Gary, Indiana, <laughs> like the murder capital of the world or mm -hmm. of the United States at the time. Mm -hmm. And oh, we pull in to this... <laughs> We pull into this parking lot. <laughs> Dana's like, park under the streetlight. Yeah. The brightest one that's there. Mm -hmm. And let's just be ready to get out of here. And so we sit there and underneath the streetlight. It was like, what, one o'clock in the morning? One in the morning, yeah, midnight. something like that. Totally empty. Send a, a Facebook message to this guy. And I say, hey, we're outside. Come meet us. And he says, all right, I'll be right there. And as we sit there under that streetlight, I see the side door of the building open and the light shines through. And there's this silhouette of a giant man holding a big box in his hand. And he starts to walk towards us. And every street light that he went under went out as he hit it. Oh, <gasps> it was one of those things where you're like watching it happen. And as it's happening, like the first time you're like, oh, OK. And then the second time you're like, oh, oh, no. And then the th I think there were three of them specifically. Just like, boom, boom, boom. That's so ominous. It was so ominous. He got to the car. <laughs> And 
I roll the window down and he starts to lean down. And as he's leaning down, the light above us goes out and he gets down and I just see his smile in the window. And he says, oh, he knows what's going to happen and he's not happy about it. I think we'd be safer inside. <laughs> and I look at Dana Sweet. and we're like, well, I, what are we going to do? That like social pressure immediately kicked in. We're like, oh, OK. All right. I guess I'm doing this. Right. It's like, what's the right choice to survive? Because exactly. not only are you guys opening yourselves up to the world of paranormal and Bigfoot and aliens and all the different types of entities and spirits that could be attached to objects, but you have to interact with humans that you really don't know mm-hmm. what People their intentions are. The are. Yeah. I mean, everything. Yeah. And also this man is like a voice told him to create something that is evil. So yes. like, what else is this voice telling him to do? He's now mm-hmm. asking you to go into a school alone. <laughs> That's oh, you're way ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. The, the scariest thing is always the people. We always, it's, and it's something that like initially, I think we never really took into consideration, but this specific pickup was one that was so frightening that it, it really changed the way that we do a lot of that kind of interaction mm. with people. It was the one, it was the one that we were like, no, we have to really think differently about this because we have to be safe as much as possible. Right. So we follow him into the school. He's in this like, one piece like a michael myers michael myers type yeah like janitor suit huge big beard he leads us into the first room around the corner as we walk in empty classroom he sits down at the teacher's desk we kind of flank him and he has this big box and i'll never forget the like the only thing that made me not completely terrified was the fact that the box containing this ancient evil entity was an Uncrustables box. And it just kind of sprayed. <laughs> Definitely cut the tension. <laughs> the tension. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he, he sits the box down. We kind of flank him around and um, he starts to tell us the story about how he was going out to the woods and he started to hear a voice in his head when he was in a particular part of these woods. And he would go there just to speak with this thing. It was reassuring him about some of his thoughts about things and people and spiritualities and ideas that he disagreed with. And Mm. it finally said, Hey, you know, you don't have to keep coming out here. I can help you build a phone and we can talk whenever you want. And so he went and followed the instructions and from the voice in his head. And he created this thing that was sort of like a pottery, like a glazed pottery head that looks like a screaming demon. Mm -hmm. And the body is like burlap. But what he didn't tell us at the time was there's like sharp edges and points and blades and stuff on the inside. So if you grab it too hard, you'll bleed on it. Oh, God. Fortunately, didn't do that. And then he said it started to not leave him alone. And when he was around this thing, things would move around his room. He started to feel terrible. One of the things the voice told him was to imbue his hatred of all of these things and people and ideas into the object. He literally called it hatred. Jeez. We could feel the vibes Mm -hmm. while we were there. And as he's talking about this, I start to hear desks and chairs like sliding around in other rooms. And I said, I thought you said we were alone. You're the only janitor. He's like, I am. That's him. And he's not happy that you're going to go. You're going to take him home. And then he grabs the side of the desk, white knuckling and says, in fact, he's telling me I need to hurt you right now. And he starts to stand up. And I immediately I'm looking around like, how long can I hold this guy off while Dana runs screaming into Gary, Indiana mm-hmm. at midnight? Yeah, <laughs> you know? I mean, we we try to as much as we can when, when we have face to face interactions with people and they're giving us things. We usually film it if they're comfortable with that. And we we're filming this one. And when you watch the footage, I was the one filming it. And at this point, like the camera literally starts shaking because I couldn't keep my hands. Oh, I was so like oh my, my I was so scared that the footage is all over the place because I was just like, yeah, like just we just got to get through this. Get And and it's one of those things where immediately your fight or flight instinct kicks in yeah. and mm-hmm. you're just like, where's every exit? Sure. How right. do we get through this scenario? And we were both, I think. Absolutely. We were the, at that place where we were like, all right, we need to just safely try to get out of here as much as as fast as we can. And it seems like anyone knowing where you were at and one in the is, morning didn't really matter. I remember specifically, I don't know if you remember this, but the high school was also sort of on the outer portion of the area. So yeah. it was kind of an isolated spot just mm-hmm. to begin with. 
mm-hmm. coupled with the fact that it was one in the morning, every no one was around, and it was genuinely a terrifying thing. Wow. So as he's standing up, and I'm like looking at the exits, and you know, trying, trying to, to yeah. feel like can, can at least Dana get out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I smell that incense. Yeah, the whole room. It was like a fog, like someone. Out of nowhere, there was like a wall of scents that just completely filled the room that we were in. And it it was like a fog. It was it, it surrounded us. And it's such a specific smell. It was yeah. absolutely 100 percent the exact same smell that we had smelled earlier in the oils that we had been given and the blessing. It was the whole room filled with this just wow. beautiful, beautiful smell. And Chills. It- oh, my gosh. And to think you wouldn't have had that protection no, exactly. if, Greg, you weren't online fighting with fighting this other with woman. Fighting <laughs> <laughs> Your Scorpio tendencies finally paid off. <laughs> See, fight with strangers and um, lightly stalk those you love. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> giving everybody He's the wrong all the Scorpio lessons today. today. It's all working out for you. Do not listen to me. No. <laughs> Dana and I looked at each other when we smelled we, that. We immediately and immediately knew. knew what we were supposed to do. And Dana starts pulling the bracelets and everything. the necklaces off. And we just start putting them on him. Yeah. All the oils, everything that we had been given, we were like, oh, this wasn't for us. This is for, this him. Is for him. Absolutely. Yeah. It was all for him. So everything, we just kind of started just loading him up with it. And it was almost immediate. Like you could feel the tension sort of leave. And he sort of started to relax. And then he was Whoa. just like, take it and you guys leave. Like, yeah, like, I, think you guys, I think you guys should leave. Yeah. And we're like way ahead of you. Yeah. And at the time we drove a, a <laughs> 2006 Scion, Scion XB, mm-hmm. which is basically a go-kart. Yes. And we <laughs> put the pedal to the metal, drove a real fast, like 35 miles an hour as <laughs> yes. fast as we could away from <laughs> Through there. Gary, Indiana. It took like a good 20 seconds to even like move <laughs> yeah. from the spot. Yes. <laughs> to start us. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as we got to a place with like we, we pull we, the cranks to get it to go. Yeah, <laughs> we pulled into you know what it was. It was a uh, it was like a grocery store. It was yeah. Uh, there was like a twenty four hour grocery store. We pulled over and I just threw up everywhere because mm-hmm. I've never been wow. that sure I was going to die. Yeah, it was that like honestly, it was immediate fight or flight. Like you just every muscle tensed in my body, and I was just like, oh, we need to like this is was a really really bad idea. So by the point that we reach sort of the outer parts of town, I think we our brains were able to sort of start coming back online again and he immediately was just like like it was just the reaction to finally having a moment to relax it was wild yeah that one i mean i wish i had a better ending to that story but uh it is it was very quiet for a long time and it has been only within the past year i would say that there have been really recent developments it's the interesting thing about investigating objects and having objects be sort of a a focal point of what we do is the investigations can last for years and years and yeah. years and they go through various phases and they change and they become, you know, different types of things. And we also learn and grow exactly. too. I exactly. mean, the things that we believe now, mm-hmm. you know, we can look back Very at different 10 years ago before. and be like, oh my God, what? Mm-hmm. why do we think We that? feel the same way, you know, like yeah. the more we read, the more people we talk to. Right. And I think that's the, I mean, coolest, but also hardest part about the paranormal is yeah. that there are no definitive answers and mm-hmm. it is continuously evolving and there's so many different types of hauntings and so we don't know anything. You guys have two objects or one object that's no longer in your possession that I think are great examples of this. Mm-hmm. Billy the Idol mm-hmm. and then the Crone of Catskills yeah. that appeared really aggressive and scary. Mm-hmm. But you found out in your research and interactions with them that they're largely just misunderstood. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And, yeah. and a lot of that I think is in terms of Billy, Billy was a uh, Congolese statue that was given to us by a man who found it in a burlap sack buried under his home. And mm-hmm. it, he believed that it was giving him and his family nightmares. And I met him. He didn't want anything to do with it. He's like, it's your, he literally said to me in the parking lot of a Walmart in like Dayton, he said, I don't care. It's your problem now. <laughs> and he walked away. <laughs> I, have a, I took a photo. There's a really funny photo of Greg coming back to the car after the interaction and the look on his face because he knows he's going to have to tell, <laughs> tell me what he, what he, and he's just like, like, it's the ultimate, like, oh, 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 it's so great. But. I mean, Dana's sitting in the car, like waiting to call 911. <laughs> I mean, I'm, that's what I'm always doing. I'm always just like, oh, but yeah, that it's true. And, and I think that's the thing is the greatest part about this is that none of us really understand what's going on. And mm-hmm. it is a matter of taking that explorative kind of approach. And I think that that is why so many of our investigations change and shape and become different things because we're constantly, we're constantly growing and learning and our opinions mm-hmm. are changing. 
and then we can apply those to the the things that we investigate as much as we can. Well, with Billy, mm -hmm. we learned we learned a lot with Billy. Billy was really the turning point yeah. in how we thought about haunted objects. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, we found out Billy was a Kisi figure, which is a, a holy relic to people in the central mm -hmm. Congo. They would use these figures to make deals with the gods, to speak to their dead, to talk to the gods of, of the air and the sky. And, and this is the thing. They came to them in dreams. Mm -hmm. These entities would come to them in dreams. I started having dreams. They were scary at first. Mm -hmm. And the responses that we got were scary at first. And we realized, well, these figures are only in the United States because white missionaries yeah. went to the Congo, took them all as prizes, destroyed their religion. And if I woke up under a white dude's house in Dayton, yeah. I'd be upset too. Mm -hmm. Same. And yeah. it took a little yeah. while to kind of understand the importance of what this type of statue was, which yeah. is why he's retired. We don't have it. We don't take him out with the museum because we realized that, you know, a couple white people from the Midwest yeah. with this holy relic uh, not that should probably be re repatriated to where it came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't ever want people to think that we're trying to make these things do tricks or disrespect them. Mm -hmm. He now has a place of honor literally in the living room. He has, a, he has an actual altar in the living room and we work with him mm -hmm. and he probably will never be in the museum. Probably yeah. will end up back in the in the Congo. The same type of thing that happened with the crone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think these things are only in our possession for a short while, both to get them to where they need to go, to educate us on getting outside of our uh, maybe the the belief systems that were instilled with us in the Western world, mm -hmm. and kind of like I understand animism a lot more than I did before. I understand different forms of ritual magic a lot more than I did before. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the most beautiful things about what you two do, Greg and Dana, is that, and I'm glad that these objects do wind up with you because you treat them with such respect and you do the extra work to do the research and really get to the bottom of what they are. And I think a lot of people wouldn't do that. And <laughs> oh, yeah. then yeah. the hauntings <laughs> yeah. would be worse. And so Corinne and I talk about it a lot and how much we admire what you two do. That yep. means so much. Really Thank means you. a lot. Yeah, you guys feel like the anomalies of the paranormal community, <laughs> too. We, yeah. we feel that way, too. It does. <laughs> you also go in with a healthy amount of skepticism as well, yeah. which yeah. a lot of people that do this frequently mm -hmm. and have a following, like they're, it's the tendency to scream ghost or paranormal or Bigfoot right, right away instead of actually doing the work to understand. There's an entertainment aspect to the paranormal because of, you know, TV shows and movies sure. and yeah. how society has portrayed it. Mm -hmm. But if you take the understanding that these souls or whatever it may be that's connected to them were once human or can be treated, should be treated with empathy the same way you should treat other humans, I think it completely changes. Yeah. You just nailed it. Yeah. We I think Billy honestly was, you know, and we've talked about this before, but I think that was the first instance where the activity that people were experiencing around Billy, that a lot of people were having dreams and, and there was a lot of uh, activity around Billy. And it was sort of this first moment for us initially where we started to really recognize how exploitive the subject matter can really be and how there mm -hmm. is an, a very strange lack of empathy and, and humanity when it comes to talking about these things, even if we're just referring to ghosts the general basic idea behind them for many people is that they are human souls that have not found their way to wherever they need to go. And right. it's weird that it's not our initial approach to be to to come at it with compassion and, and empathy and humanity. Instead, <laughs> no, we're going to fight them. Exactly. <laughs> come it's at a, me. It's, it's a terrible. Weird thing. Come it's at like, me, bro. Yeah. Yeah. We've taken a weird turn when it comes to that, like how we approach it and, and, and interact yeah. with it. And so we try as much as we can to bring that into pretty much everything that we do as much as, as much as we can. There's a cognitive yeah. dissonance with yeah. a lot of people who have sort of set themselves up as people with the answers because they will yell at you up and down saying, no, these are the souls of the dead. They are intelligent, but we're not going to treat them that yeah, way. We're gonna or we're really going to talk to them like them. I think we did even when we were at the conjuring house with you guys. One of the first things we said is like we try really hard not to sound like we're talking to babies when like we do EVP kids. sessions. Yeah, which is like which yeah. you default to yeah. because you just sort of go, "Well, can you?" Yeah, it's an your your voice goes up a couple yeah. octaves, it's and it's, a, if someone talked to me like that, I'd, I'd be, be like, like, "What do you? You think something's wrong with me?" <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah it's like <laughs> condescending. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So just real quick, I just wanted to find out if you still have the object that you retrieved from this guy. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll give you a little sneak at where yeah, we'll this give- is probably going. And I don't know. Again, this stuff changes with every piece of information we get. Mm-hmm. About a year and a half ago, I got an email from somebody who knows you know, some of the details about hatred we haven't shared publicly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he sent me a photo. And it's a photo of a seven foot tall hatred from Sweden. Mm-hmm. Somebody in Sweden went to the forest and a voice talked to them in their head and told them to build it. And it's the same. It looks exact. And so the thing that, about it is it's a very distinct design. Like it, it's huge. It is, and it's the same design randomly. This is scaring the shit out of me. It's really, it's a little, un- you know, we have to investigate it. We have to kind of continue and, and come into it as much as we can. Yeah. How do you not investigate that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. But yeah. So, yeah. so when are we all going to Sweden? I'm inviting ourselves. Come on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> This is such a challenge for you guys, too, that you have to you have to take everything worldwide, too. It's not like you just get the the benefit of having to research something locally. I feel like so yeah. many of the objects, you guys have to really immerse yourselves in these yeah. cultures and like dig so deep to figure out what's actually going on. It's funny because you saying that it's been really a, a positive, beneficial thing for us because it sort of helps us uh, break down our own Western ideals about because when you when you explore the paranormal from other cultural perspectives, suddenly you get very different ideas about what's going what is going mm-hmm. on. And expanding your mind into some of those spaces allows you to evolve and develop and, and change. And so it, it's been a really wonderful thing for us. And I think in a lot of ways, it helps us be better investigators is to sort of yeah. break apart a lot of those those things that we've been taught and what we, we naturally kind of default to when it comes to the paranormal, specifically in the West. And it has really helped to tear down a lot of those unnecessary kind of bias that exists just organically. Kind of also goes back to the haunted painting that you're creating, right? This idea that a haunting is so based on the people, the beliefs, the energy around it. And so you have to consider societal factors and cultural factors. Every story we hear is coming from somebody's lived experience. Yeah. And to yeah. try and like stick that in a box is very, I don't think it's fair. Yeah. Because, right. you know, our, one of our big things that we've we've come to learn is the paranormal is subjective for everybody. And you can take that one of two ways. You can either go, well, it's not real because I can't experience the same exact thing. Or you can mm-hmm. say, yeah. well, if it's subjective, maybe I should subject myself to it. Mm-hmm. See what kind of experience I have. Compare that to this person's experience, find the commonalities between those two. And then you start to realize the our brains are, I think, the most important mechanism to how paranormal phenomena yeah. manifest. And if you have a specific view of the paranormal, it's going to show you something specific to you mm-hmm. in order to enact whatever change it's trying to get you to affect. <laughs> we can talk we can go back to telling scary stories it's, <laughs> no i mean these are very important mindsets to talk about when it comes to the paranormal and i think it's great to have this type of conversation it I, is i think of it sort of i love i like using visual sort of imagery and the way that my brain always kind of conjures an image is of kind of light coming through a prism each of us like you said each of us have had our unique individual experience lived reality and we are sort of in a lot of ways reflecting the paranormal is reflecting through the prism of our identity, of our personality and giving us this very strange experience to have that might initiate us in some way, change us in some way. So it is. And, and for or some speak of us for it or, because it can't or speak also, for itself. Exactly. And so yeah. you get all of these really beautiful. It, it's like a tapestry when you really look at it. It's all of these different colors. But really, we are looking at like sort of one big thing. But when you zoom in, you can see that you can observe it in lots and lots of different ways, Mm -hmm. depending on where you come from, what your life has been like, what kind of trauma you have or what kind of joy you have. And it it all sort of filters through us so that we can observe it outside of ourselves, which is like, it's beautiful. Like, it really is a beautiful thing. Well, I remember us talking about this, too, when we were all together at The Conjuring House, that we've received emails and I even had an experience of my own where something that I thought was haunting for a really long time in my life, as I've gotten older, I've started to have the realization that I actually think it was me mm. in the future yeah. dealing with some trauma and whatever I do, because it hasn't happened yet, whatever I do in that moment 
brings me back to that period and I'm the one haunting myself. Yeah. It's just all these things where it's like, it takes so long to develop or even like understand something that could be as basic as like, oh, I saw a woman in the corner of my room and she'd right. come and like comfort me by petting my hair. Right. It seems so basic that you would scream like, oh, that's a ghost or that's right. a that's a spirit guide or whatever. And it just, there's so many different layers to things. And as mm-hmm. we mature and we have different understandings of things, how drastic all of that can shift. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, it's one of the reasons why we don't, we try not to ever criticize someone's lived paranormal experience and we try not to we try to offer alternatives and new and different things but you can take it or leave it because the bottom line is i think and you might agree with this i'm not sure but it's this in my mind i think of it as a journey and as as you sort Mm. of journey into the woods that are the paranormal we learn to like our eyes shift a little bit we can see in the dark a little bit better we have a better idea and i think even if you're someone who isn't necessarily psychic or any or even believing in those types of things i think that we unconsciously kind of tap into different types of energies because we're around them a lot if we're interested in this kind of stuff it's like watching someone kind of take that journey and when you when you can come to the conclusion on your own it's so much more impactful like your story is so beautiful it's incredible and Mm -hmm. and just having gone through the process of coming to that conclusion is such a cool thing. It's it's lovely to see. I love that. Yeah. But if you'd been closed off to it. Yeah. If you had been closed off and not open minded enough to to imagine, wait, what if that is me? Yeah. What, what if that's not what I thought it was? You wouldn't have that beautiful experience that provides an interesting new way to look at your own life. Mm-hmm. Insight. And that's yeah. what makes me so sad about one of my friends called it the paranormal industrial complex. They are just telling the same story over and over and over. And it's one that reinforces fear without a way out of that fear that doesn't involve either one specific religious belief or one specific belief about what ghosts are. And so I feel bad for so many people who are experiencing what I truly do think are spontaneous, initiatory experiences that we have evolved to have. Mm -hmm. We have been seeing and experiencing ghosts and strange things since man could write it down. Mm -hmm. And now... We are still stuck in that idea that they're like a bad thing because of, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. a handful of bad actors that are telling us these things are Mm -hmm. terrible for you and you better not experience them. But yeah, I can do it for you. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) it's the realization that and I think what's cool about it is for a lot of people, they get to a point where if it's something that they're really interested in. I think at a certain point, a lot of that stuff doesn't really work on them. They get to a point where they're like, ah, that's fine, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going down the road because I think there might be more interesting things around this bend. And so we just constantly try to be like, come further down the road with us. It's weirder down here. It's so much (laughs) fun. What's the phrase? The phrase, the map is not the territory. Yes, exactly. Mm, I like that. Yeah. The map is to get you to the edge, but it's up to you to chart your own path. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I love that. But okay, but also that all being said, there are some things that are dangerous to to dabble in and are there are some are things there? that people should be <laughs> cautious. I guess maybe it's the way you approach it, right? Because yes. there are some yeah. people yeah. who yeah. Yes. like Ouija boards can be used in a really negative way. And if you're not protecting yourself, perhaps you could be inviting something a little bit darker in, right? I think that it's it's a matter of sort of unpacking the pop culture because the that will always kind of find its way into the conversation is a lot of things there's a lot of sort of misinformation the, the interesting thing about the paranormal community is there's no rules so people can sort of just make them up as they go and right. that's a great thing because it, it leads us open to exploration but it can also be uh difficult because like you said you can you can find that elements of things will come into it and inevitably you you'll bump into that you know don't don't go down that road kind of thing you know make yeah. sure you close the ouija board yes and i think the thing is i think that as long as we are interested in the subject matter continuing to kind of educate ourselves about safe ways for us personally because for you, using a Ouija board might be something that is just not, you're not interested in that. And that is your right. choice. And it's how you feel about it. And and so it's great that you would have people around you that would respect that. And it's just a matter of making sure that we just kind of continue having a, like a healthy foundation to observe mm-hmm. these things from. And I think that in doing that, it gives us more of a clarity and a, a, an ability to discern because I think discernment is sort of the biggest issue when it mm-hmm. comes to that kind of stuff. And then We know where we're comfortable, what we're comfortable doing, what we're not comfortable doing. But it's when people kind of make blanket statements about things like all Ouija boards are terrible. Don't ever touch them. Portals will open. And you kind of immediately 
it stops people from being allowed to be curious about something. Sure. When really, yeah. if we had that solid foundation of knowledge and information underneath our feet, we'd be less afraid and we'd be a little bit more, we'd have that discernment so that we can move cautiously into right. spaces where we may experience things that aren't great because like in all things, you can meet like the shittiest human being at the grocery store. Yeah. It, it just happens. It can happen right. anywhere. Well, it's also if someone says something enough, like if we're told Ouija boards are going to create portals and are negative enough, <laughs> yes. but then I'm tempted and I want to do it just to like <laughs> understand, but that's the cognitive mind I'm going into that with, then yeah. I'm probably also perpetuating that belief mm -hmm. in using it. But you don't know you're doing yes. it. And that's the, that's right. the, I think the real danger of, of the paranormal is not knowing is not understanding where the information we're repeating is yes. coming from, yes. because when you trace you it back, it. You can start to understand where these ideas and concepts came from, and you can see who's actually doing the research. Like, the thing about Ouija boards is- it's exactly, yeah. It's the perfect We're example. recording this around Valentine's Day. <laughs> Ouija boards were marketed as a date thing. Yeah. Where you could sit really close to someone you love. So your knees what? could touch. Yeah, back in the 40s and the 50s. And your hands could touch. Yeah. And you could sit with your crush and, and do something cute and spooky, but you were physically close to someone- you wow. had you would ask love questions and marriage questions and all that kind of wow. stuff. Wow! And then with I mean, The Exorcist being you know obviously the scariest movie ever made, <laughs> it really started to change the perception of Ouija boards, and suddenly they became mm. things that kind of brought that negative connotation in with them. And people have had frightening experiences with them. They're tools of yeah. divination. Yeah. You can have a scary experience with any form of divination, but the Ouija board now has this like extra layer of fear mm -hmm. brought into it and yeah. and it, it takes on a different meaning then and then we have to approach it with a different perspective sort of yeah i'll send you guys some pictures after this of of old ouija board advertisements so from cute. like the 50s and the 60s <laughs> and it's Please literally do. it's always a couple sitting together mm -hmm. That's and so like, cute. And like, you know, the, you can tell they're, they're kind of touching each hands other. hands and their knees are touching. It's just very cute. I think there's like a famous Norman Rockwell. There's a famous Norman Rockwell yeah, painting. of like a cute couple using the Ouija board together. <laughs> they were, they didn't used to have this. Yeah. This like wow. satanic overtone. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's weird. Right. But now we get it so much, which is like uh, you guys talking about this is just making me reflect on my own experience where it's like I have no fear using my pendulum. Yeah. And how different is my pendulum than using a Ouija board? Yeah. But we've just had so much information fed to us that Ouija boards, if you do it incorrectly, something horrible can happen. We've received, Sabrina and I, so many emails. I'm sure you guys have heard a million different stories. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. So it's yeah. like, I think the thing that Sabrina and I have also felt in the past few years is we want to do everything correctly. So it's not that we're closed yeah. off to doing anything, but it's like, you know, our very first paranormal investigation and in overnight we called you guys because we were like, <laughs> we're going to do it wrong. Like, we're going to fuck something up if we just try it. Like, we need to learn from the people that know more than us. And so I think we've been taking kind of baby steps towards things yeah. because we're being super cautious and trying to be really <laughs> respectful. You taught us so much about intention setting. And that's something Corinne and I have kind of been talking to a lot of people who practice witchcraft. And also Corinne and I both have a lot of our own abilities that we would love to tap into and learn mm -hmm. more about. And so, so much of that journey for us has been about setting intentions yeah, and then so with great. new practices that we're exploring again, just being like, you know, what I want to get out of this and reading Oracle cards or tarot cards. It's very much like I've been spending time meditating almost and setting some type of intention and trying to connect with my ancestors and guardians to help guide me through the practice. I love it. And That's I think so great. you can take that approach with Ouija boards too. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I love, and it's something that I've noticed happening quite a bit over the past few years, is there has been in the past almost a fear, specifically in the paranormal community, to explore places within esoterica or the occult or witchcraft. And the irony is occultists and witches and magic practitioners have like kind of quietly been going like, they're going to catch on eventually. <laughs> because it, it, they're tools that we can use as people who are interested in investigating these things that, mm -hmm. that give us discernment. Yeah. They are new tools that we can use to approach and observe the things that we're experiencing and protect us from things that we maybe, you know, con communicating with ancestors can be protective for you. But whatever it is, it's another set of tools that you have as an investigator in your toolbox that you can use to investigate, observe, discern, and interact with these types of things. And it really, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I love seeing people kind of 
start yeah. to bring that with them. And, and intention setting is like the best way to do that. I love it. Yeah. It almost feels like a pre-step, too, for a lot of the investigations where it's like <gasps> a reminder to the space, to the house, to the woods, and to anything that's around yeah. that you're going to be respectful and you're going to respond to what they give you. Mm-hmm. Because it's reminding yeah. me, again, at the Conjuring House, all four of us went in with the ideas that of what everyone else has said about the Conjuring House. Mm-hmm. And is that true? Is that not? And I just remember at the very end of the night, we ended up, I mean, we had the house until what, 8 a.m. And then we ended up leaving at 4.30 because the pendulum that we were using was so taut. It like wasn't trying to speak at all. The house felt a little bit quieter and more relaxed and kind of sleepy. And so we were responding to the house being like, I think I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Exactly. Uh, we had a lovely time. The yeah. energy in that place felt nice. It didn't it didn't yeah. feel scary, you know? I mean, at the beginning when you're feeling it out, it can be like any situation. Mm-hmm. It's a little, you know, there's nervousness. Yeah. yeah. And especially yeah. when you're going into it with your your mind is full with stories and information and and things that other people have experienced. So you kind of go in loaded, like prepared to have that kind right. of experience. But like you said, when you set that intention, you get that sort of solid footing underneath you. You can see the environment a little bit more clearly. And and it's, again, mm-hmm. I, I'm like a broken record, but it, it allows for discernment so that you can kind of look mm-hmm. at it and go, okay, what's going on in here? And I think right. you're right. Like we left feeling that it was, I felt kind of fun. Like it was a yeah. very fun experience. And I sort fun. of, it was, I kept like, we I, had some spooky moments. Yeah, for sure. But Definitely. overall, like I didn't leave thinking no. this place was demonic no, or anything not, like, that. like that. You know, I don't No. I don't get that impression from yeah. most places, honestly. I mean, you two totally encouraged our, now it's like something that Corinne and I are doing continuously. We're going to more haunted places. Hell That's yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we love investigating. You've enabled us again. <laughs> Perfect. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> you are our influencers. <laughs> we just copy whatever yeah, you do. Truly. Paranormal pushers. Yeah. <laughs> First taste is free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure people know too, you guys are incredibly flattering. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like we we just commit ourselves to experiences mm-hmm. and we we experience them as fully as we can and try and like come up with what feels like the right path through. And sometimes it feels like there's a guiding hand and sometimes we have Mm -hmm. to forge our own way. Everything that we have ever done in the paranormal has been trial and error. Mm -hmm. And we're very Mm -hmm. pro trial and error. And we're giving you what we've found to be true after 25 years of doing this, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I don't want to, again, I don't want to take anything away from somebody else's experience. If they've had an experience and they say it's scary I believe them. We get stuff like Mm -hmm. that all the time. We get haunted objects sent to us that never act up for us. You know, most of them never do anything. But I respect that experience. All we're ever trying to do is help people break out of that mindset that the paranormal industrial complex has given them and give them options. And when they're provided, Mm -hmm. because they don't know there's even options. Mm -hmm. When they're provided options, you go, oh, wait a second. This can be a really beautiful Sometimes scary experience, but scary experiences help us grow. Mm-hmm. They help us learn. Yeah, yeah. You And learn if you are scared of the dark, you're never going to know yeah. what's making right. that sound yeah. in the basement. Yeah. And maybe it's a kitten. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you get a kitten if you go into <laughs> the dark that. basement. <laughs> you know? One of the things, I mean, it's a motto that we, we use constantly. And it's sort of our, the motto that it kind of best describes the way that we approach things in the paranormal. And it's really just curiosity over fear. We try to Mm. be as curious about something. And I think you can be curious and cautious and you can be curious and protect yourself. But we try to, when we're faced with the moments where there's fear that comes in and it feels as if it's a fear that someone else has either placed upon something, or it's a fear that we're kind of bringing with us into something that isn't really how we actually feel about it. We let ourselves explore the idea of being curious about it. So Hatred is a great example. It's it's an object that is frightening, that people have had frightening experiences with. But as much as we can in those instances, in a safe way, we try to approach that investigation with curiosity and, and allow right. ourselves to be curious about what, why, when, where, and how. Yeah. If you do it in a way that's safe, what you find is that there are a lot of new doors that you can go through. And, and I think having the foundation of things like intention setting and exploring some of those different kind of modalities and ways of, of investigating can give you, again, that sort of solid footing so you can be a little bit more curious and you can go, well, right. I don't really agree with that. Maybe I think a little bit differently about that. I'm mm-hmm. going to cautiously explore this a bit. And so it gives you that 
the space to do that a bit more. So in regard to the objects that you guys have, that you live amongst many of them, plus you yourselves go out and are around a lot of different energies, it's not only you two that are affected by it, but you also have pets. Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you introduce these new energies to your home? <laughs> and then how do you decide where to put them? Like, have you ever put two objects next to each other and they've like yes. gotten in a fight? Yes. We have a, I, we brought it with us, the, the dark mirror to the conjuring house. The dark yeah. mirror mm-hmm. is like a battery. And whenever we take it with us to, if, we, if we've done an event or something like that, and a lot of people have looked in it, it's like, we always describe it as the kid that you don't want your kid to hang out with because it's a bad influence <laughs> on all of the other ones. And it, it's they got the Kool-Aid mouth. Yeah, they're, they're just going to like start trouble. <laughs> so it's, again, like Greg has said before, it's a lot of trial and error and it's a lot of recognizing that some things just can't be in the same vicinity as other things. So mm-hmm. pretty much everything in the museum is, we have very specific places where we keep them. And like with all things, one of the things that we talk a lot about is energetic hygiene. So when you're somebody who goes into some of these spaces or you're you're investigating, you kind of have to keep in mind that like we have physical hygiene that we do and we probably should also have some energetic hygiene. So clearing mm-hmm. away a lot of energy. And one thing that we've noticed specifically with the objects is it's just not letting that energy get too stagnant. If I haven't cleansed or cleared a place out in a while, if it's allowed to sort of sit and really kind of root itself, that's when we start experiencing really weird things. Mm. So we just have mm. sort of a cycle of energetic cleansing that we do in the house, uh, energetic hygiene that we do for ourselves. And we just it's literally like brushing our teeth at that point. We just kind of do yeah. the same things. Every time someone gives us an object, it's like chapter one for us because we want to continue that investigation. We want to understand why there's been activity around it. So I also think the aspect of uh, that conflict resolution, like wanting to come to some kind of a conclusion sort of helps things not feel too stagnant. Not like it's not sure. a mm-hmm. thing that's being forgotten. Oh, this thing's being weird. Well, there it goes on the shelf. And then you experience weird things, but you're not really curious about why or how or if you can help it. And I think that coming at things from that perspective helps us sort of live amongst so much weird, th- so many weird things. We watch our cats too. We do. They, they react. To they stuff. really do. Like our cat Oliver. We always say trust your pets. So. Yes. Oh yeah, trust 100%. your pets. Our cat yeah. Oliver inspects every new item that comes in. Everything. He's like he's a, he's a weird cat where he he has to smell and inspect every new thing that comes into the house, whether it's in a box or not. And I kid you not, there are times when he growls. He does. He just and knows. that's when we are like, oh. Something's up with this one. Yeah. Spirit photos. Oh. Every the spirit whenever the spirit photos show up, he starts to growl. Mm-hmm. We've got a collection of of antique like Victorian spirit photos, and there's a couple of them. Yeah. That he's had a really strong response to, and as soon as they came in the house, we have a cabinet. We have kind of like a proto brick and mortar museum that we're. It's kind of like our vision board for what the brick and mortar is going to look like in, in mm-hmm. the house. And uh, he sits in that room all day. He does. Just like, he loves it in there. Just like. I think he's guarding it. He's, a, he's like, <laughs> oh. he's like an ener- he, he's so interesting because I feel like he's just chasing kind of negative energy around and getting rid of it. Like he, you'll just see him doing it all day long. Kicking them out. He's just, yeah, yeah, he's like, get hit the bricks. But anything that's too, we keep most of the objects downstairs. We have like very yeah. specific places where we keep everything. And the cats, we don't let the cats down here. We just kind of, just for our own sanity, we keep them upstairs. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they definitely know. They, they know. absolutely know. Yeah. That's wild. I mean, my family dog, when he had passed away, my house in Vermont, I told you guys, was very haunted Mm -hmm. growing up on and off. And when my dog passed away for six months, it was completely silent other than just hearing his spirit, like the clickety clickety of his nails on the hardwood floor or like seeing new scratch marks where he would stretch. But everything else was dead silent. And we're like, oh, my gosh, he's patrolling the house. He's kicking all of the ghosts out. (laughs) Oh, so I love sweet. that so much. That's the best. I he was that. finally on on like an even playing ground as them. And so he was like, wrap it up, <laughs> this folks. This is his territory now. <laughs> He's a bouncer. Yeah. He's getting rid of everything. He was the bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What's the newest addition to your museum? Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Uh I I have a new working ritual dagger now. Yes, Greg. We, um, yeah, wait, you cut yourself on it, yes. didn't you? That, I don't think we've talked about this publicly. You gave yourself like stigmata. It's a Tell- nice big uh, scar. It now. looks so wow. good now. It's going to heal internally. I think for another month and a half. Do you want to tell them it. what happened? Well, that the sort of proto museum room. I was putting the finishing touches on it, 
and I had this old like 1970s, 1960s hermetic order of the golden dawn air dagger and they're beautiful they get this beautiful yellow handle and there's like you know there's some hebrew text on it uh, it is beautiful gorgeous how'd you find it literally magician i just purchased it off a of magician dead magician's law <laughs> like a lot of the stuff that we get <laughs> our focus is really not haunted objects those just come to us yeah, it's, they, it's historical right. paranormal artifacts yeah we the, yeah. the museum is sort of it is an attempt to curate all aspects of the paranormal. So we also try, like one of the things that we have a lot of, and we've really been focusing a lot is investigators of sort of days gone by. A lot of the times, a lot, all of their research is just sitting in like, you know, basements and in, you know, wow. lots we have rescued all over the place. So many people's stuff. Life from, work. Someone's from going it, into the garbage. It's incredible. And it's filled with so much useful information and you have someone else's perspective on an investigation of something. So we really try to focus as much as we can on curating paranormal history, but also having a lot of things that other investigators will eventually be able to use. Mm. We'll have them so that they're accessible. This research is accessible to other paranormal investigators because you have your own library. We really we do. do. Yeah, we're really trying so to build cool. one. We think about all the time is there there was an investigator of uh, many things, but the Mothman prophecies was written by a man named John Keel. And he's one of the the greatest investigators of high strangeness, sort of a really big inspiration for a lot of people who are interested in, in UFOs and high strangeness. And when he passed, they threw all of his research out, like most of it. It's just gone forever. And this was a lifetime. This man was he investigated. That's so upsetting. It's so, so upsetting. And we started realizing that, you know, we can curate a lot of these things. So we we really sure. made an effort to do that as much as we can. Well, when we reached out to you to about joining us at the Conjuring House, Greg, you were driving cross country with UFO wreckage yes! and documents from Area 51. Exactly. <laughs> Literally. Exactly. Ex yes, yeah. yes. That's and and, so and you're like, talk to you in a few days. Got to get home to Jaina. <laughs> <laughs> Carting some valuables. It is true. And you know what's funny? We The very last episode of the first season of the podcast, mm -hmm. of, the, of yes. our, the Haunted Objects podcast, we did a, a whole thing about the guy who owned that stuff mm -hmm. and how much he influenced. Like he's the guy who put Area 51 on the map. He and really this stuff did. was just going to go in the trash. Mm -hmm. And there's research files and like stakeout videos where he was like at Jeez. the Vegas airport watching who was flying to Area 51. The reason we know so much about it now is literally yeah. because of him. He put the maps together. He found this place called yeah. Freedom Ridge where you could see in and it would have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And Lost forever. It's beautiful work. And that's the type of thing that we're trying to do. That's mm -hmm. where the ritual dagger came from, was from a lot like that. So there were like mm -hmm. ritual robes and things like that. I was putting the finishing touches I can't on that did this. room. And I have this, you know, the shelves are about like that. And I'm like, how am I going to display this beautiful, this beautiful dagger? And I saw a group of candles that had sigils etched in on them from a ritual that we did mm -hmm. at the Proctor house yeah. in, for an episode of a, a show called Kindred Spirits. And I picked out the one that I had drawn. There was a sigil on the side that I had drawn. And it's been so long, I can't remember what the sigil was for, what it was supposed to manifest. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, this will look really cool if I take the blade of the dagger and I like put it down into the candle and display it right side up in there. And I did that. It looked sick. And I went to put it on the shelf and the handle was about that much too tall to fit. And I was like, oh, I just got to push it into the wax a little further. The wax was kind of hard. And I oh, no. pushed it in, not thinking. The candle splits in half oh, my God. and the dagger goes and it like touches oh. bone. Oh, God. So oh, my God. Have you thought about the fact that you kind of just did like a blood ritual accidentally? Oh, you don't. Well, wait, <laughs> just wait, just wait. That gets, there's elements I have not talked about on social oh media. Oh my yes. gosh. I look at my hand and there's a dagger sticking straight it's out so of it. It's so sharp too. It, like after the fact, I was looking at it and I was like, oh my, this was like so, so sharp. This isn't like, it's not like a a costume knife or anything like it's a mm -hmm. it was really sharp and it was definitely in there like at least that much now i look at it and i'm like why didn't i take a picture it would be the most metal album cover ever mm -hmm. <laughs> but i was thinking and i realized i was holding another artifact in my hand with the knife as i did that and i dropped it obviously and i didn't think about it Ugh. pulled the knife out and blood just starts pouring pours all over the artifact <gasps> and i don't think about it immediately i was like as calmly as I could. Dana, we have to go to the emergency room. 
and she runs in and, you know, sees what's going on. And we get in the car, we go to the emergency room, very hard to explain what happened to the people <laughs> at the front desk, get five stitches, tetanus shot, tetanus shot, mm-hmm. come home, look at the stuff that's going on, on the ground and realize what item it is. I, I tell you guys off air because you're going to scream, <laughs> realize what, what, what it is. And then Dana goes, you know, what's weird. The minute that you stabbed your hand, I got a phone call from a number that I didn't recognize. And I'm like, well, that, uh, what, what is it? And she's like, I don't know. And I was do like, well, have, let's Google it. Do you have the audio on your phone? <sighs> you have to get, oh, your I phone. have my phone right here. I'll play this audio for you. Okay. So oh my gosh, okay, this is no one has no heard, one's any heard of this. this. <laughs> so I, I look at the timing and I'm literally on the edge of my seat. I've been leaning, I, for, who are both more leaning forward. forward. <laughs> My phone gets a phone call as either the moment that this happened or the minute or as we were driving to the hospital and I'm not paying attention to it. Hours and hours go by and I was like, oh, yeah, I got a weird phone call. And they left a message. And this, this is the message that is left. I don't know who at the time that this is happening. I have no idea. The number is listed, but it doesn't say where it's coming from. And I had to do hmm. a bit of research to find it. Here's what the audio is. So this is sent to my phone probably around the time that where did it go we from? looked at the math this last that night is. and it and it, it lines up within minutes of this happening okay. and dana her number's not listed our private numbers listed. are not anywhere no one and we'll give you a bit more information after you hear it but here's the audio Okay. It feels like a Furby called you. I it's like slurping, wet, like, like slurping. weird mouth sounds. <laughs> and then a little kid. And going, then little, goodbye. Goodbye. Dana Googles the number and sees that it comes from an address on Green Devil Lane. And so immediately we're like, oh, this is related to the Hellier case we've been working on. Mm-hmm. That's really strange. And then we realize it's a high school in Kentucky mm-hmm. and their mascots are the Green Devils which are kind of pan. They literally look like pan, mm-hmm. which is all in our series Hellier. And I look at the, um, <laughs> I look at the candle and the candle that has split the sigil on it literally looks, and I didn't realize this, mm-hmm. looks like a dagger going into a palm. It's I'll like- send you photos. Literally, yeah. What and in the world? Four years ago. Four or five years ago. And then- a few days later, one of our museum members goes back and watches an investigation we had done with the artifact. They don't know this artifact, by the way. Mm-hmm. They'll know after they listen to this <laughs> yes. episode, but they can know. They watched an investigation with the artifact I was holding in my hand at the time. And while Dana's doing the Estes Method, she goes, those aren't kids from that school. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's four years ago. Yeah. I hate this so much. It, everything about it is so perfectly like, it's literally like, oh, there's the puzzle piece. Oh, there's the puzzle piece. And it's like. It's I, like Dana was saying, like, sometimes you, yeah. you have to be patient because these puzzle pieces, they don't Slowly. work linearly. No, they it kind of happens across. It's like your story. Karen. Yes. The same type of yeah. thing where you don't know. Exactly. Oh, that's just me. And you might not get the piece that fits next into the piece that you already have. You might get the one that you need for four right. years in the future. So it's a matter of going like eventually realize, oh, crap. And now I have all the pieces and look at that. They all fit together. How weird is that? Oh, my God. And the way you had to put those pieces together are pretty painful. Yeah, but- <laughs> not so fun. I have a badass scar now. Though. That's true. That the coolest true. thing is I get to tell people I stabbed a guy. And you were And stabbed. I got stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> you can pick either depending on the conversation. Exactly. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's so good. Well, now I'm so curious what it is. And you'll tell us afterwards. I'll tell you. Yes. I'll tell you. Yeah. 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 I have to tell you guys too, because you guys didn't see all the bits of footage and, and video that we took oh, yeah. for no. from the Conjuring House. But this isn't paranormal. This is just, <laughs> we found it very funny. There were like three moments where Sabrina and I, one of us was scared. And it was so funny to see your reactions to us being scared because it wasn't really like acknowledging it as much because you guys were much braver and you knew what was going on. And it was us just like picking up on like, oh my gosh, this is happening. And there was (laughs) one where Sabrina's like taking me through some breathing exercises quietly in the corner of the couch because I was a little scared. And I was like, wow, I'm so scared. 
Sabrina goes, that's okay. Just breathe through it. And Dana, you just walk behind me and turn all the lights off. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so sorry. (laughs) Cold. (laughs) Cold. It's so funny because in the moment, in the moment, there was nothing that felt wrong about that move because we were preparing like (laughs) <laughs> but out of context, it's so just funny. that one little clip was nice. so funny. We were cracking up. That's so it's time cool. to learn to swim. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. Let's do it. And then when we were doing the Estes method and Dana, you were hooked in and Greg, you were hearing all of the questions and the answers live with us. There was a part where Sabrina asks, is there anything that we can do to make it better when we were hearing about the bodies buried somewhere in the in the field? And they said, you, or Dana, it was through through your voice, but I asked, is there anything that could make it better? And it responded, you, or Dana through S's method. And Sabrina's like, <gasps> and Greg, oh. you are cracking up. <laughs> <laughs> my, you, That's I'll his be, default to fear. My default honestly. fear response is to laugh. <laughs> Laughing hysterically. Uh, it's very true. Laughter is the best well, exorcism. Well, us too. I was laughing too. So. <laughs> Good. That's it's true. So, La- it's so funny. Laughter is the best exorcism. Isn't if you're weird, scared, though? just la- find something to laugh about and it immediately shifts your energy and right. suddenly you're like, all right, everything's not so bad. There's like yeah. a part of you that doesn't expect to be acknowledged. And so the sure. weird thing is like yeah. when it acknowledges yeah, it's you, weird. It's a weird thing. It's a strange thing. And it's, you're like, you mm-hmm. can see me. What? Like it's the, yeah, it's well, the strange it's, thing. It's constant. Even now we've been doing this so long. And even I now still, there's times when I look at, I will look at my friends when something unbelievable happens. Like if we're on a case or we're shooting something and something insane happens, I look at them and I go, oh, this shit's real. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. This yeah. is real. Yeah. Because there's always yeah. that voice, you know, mm-hmm. you're always, right. always right. Right. like, are Part we just it. Yeah. LARPing? Yeah. <laughs> Nope. Nope. This is real. real. Monsters are real, I guess. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Another story, and I don't know if you are allowed to talk about this or if you want to talk about this, but aliens. Yeah. (laughs) You two shared a wild story about a hypnosis. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So in in the second season of our series, Hellier, there is a very controversial episode mm-hmm. <laughs> where we performed an experiment. People were mad at us there, after the fact. Yeah. Um, but I think that the ends justify the means. Yeah. It was everyone. Mm-hmm. It was consensual. It was consensual. Experimentation. We all and know. Everyone's okay. We all know what we're signing up for. Yes. And we've done this a few times now. We have. Yeah. There was uh, years and years ago before we were working on a web series that we were trying to make. And one of the ideas was this episode of the web series was we want to get abducted by aliens. What can we do to get abducted by aliens? Earnestly. Mm-hmm. Like we really we wanted, wanted to really. try as much as we could. We, we went to one of the biggest UFO hotspots. A lot of people have experiences. And people a lot claim of, they've been taken by lights in the sky at this place. Yeah. A lot of experiencers have had, uh, you know, their own kind of UFO sightings there. So we, we went genuinely wanting to have some kind of an experience as much as we mm-hmm. possibly could. Didn't happen the old fashioned way. Yeah. So we uh, started to think up an experiment and I contacted a hypnotist and said, hey, hypnosis is used in a lot of alien abduction memory recovery cases. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pros and cons. You know, if you look at the old satanic panic cases back from like the 80s, Michelle remembers like stuff like that. You see hypnosis used in a very bad way that Mm -hmm. hurt a lot of people. Yeah. And so we're like, well this is going to be funny. We're going to try and get, instead of having one pulled out of us, let's put an abduction experience Mm -hmm. into one of us. See if there's physical manifestations, see if this person comes out believing in it, et cetera, et cetera. A friend of ours who did not believe in, in extraterrestrials did not think that they existed, ended up being the one who was chosen for this experiment. So in a hotel, how are they chosen? Well, we did hypnosis we did induction hi- tests. Yeah. So the the group of us, everyone was sort of prepared to possibly be the person chosen, but we wanted to see who was most susceptible to hypnosis and who mm. would sort of go under as fast as they could. So we did a couple of different experiments where we allowed the hypnotist to sort of put us into light trance to see if like we were we, we were the kind of person who would hypnotism would work on. And there was right. one out of the group of us who was very, very. Uh, well, there were two. Yeah, there were we, two. We, we were cr- kind of trying to rig the game so that our. We really, were. 
one funny of our funniest friends would go yeah. and we could sit there and like whisper in the hypnosis, you know, hypnotist we ear wanted and be it like, to be as right. lighthearted you know, tell him he's possible. getting probed. You know, we thought they would be so funny to have, to give him the most ridiculous experience possible, right? Well, the problem was the other guy who was just as susceptible had told the hypnotist that he didn't believe in hypnotism. Yeah. And so he was like, oh, I have something to prove now. Challenge. Hmm. And it's the same one who didn't believe in aliens too, right? Same one yes. who didn't believe in aliens. Didn't believe... And like this person, he's our friend, Jason Gowan. He's also very lighthearted, very fun. Like he's a very sweet, lighthearted person. He's not mm -hmm. the kind of person who goes to kind he of dark, go dark places very fast. If he ever did that, I would be like, it would be a very strange. He was in the unbinding. Friend. Yes. He was, um, mm -hmm. he was a 3D scanning guy. He was guy. a 3D scan. He did the 3D scan. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. He's okay. really funny, really sweet, just really lovable, lighthearted person. And the hypnotist sits him down, shakes his Immediately hand. Immediately he's under. Pulls him. Handshake induction, it like confuses your Immediately? brain. Immediately? Immediately. It happens so fast. Handshake inductions are this thing that the hypnotists will use. And it's meant to kind of, they go in for a handshake. So give me your hand. I'm trying to get you to do it. Oh, they sorry. go in for a handshake and they'll take their other hand and they'll take your hand and put it right over the palm of your face. And it's it's meant to immediately confuse you because you're like, what the heck is going This is so strange. Yeah, yeah. So it changes the brain and it immediately puts the brain into a different state. And then some people who are susceptible to handshake inductions will then kind of fall into that hypnotic state very wow. easily. Oh and and he was a person who immediately was was under. I, and he he didn't give him nearly as much mm -mm. of a, of a like leading mm -hmm. phrases as I expected. It was very he, very much like op open world. He let him sort of go through his own experience. Right. He immediately is under and the hypnotist says you're in a field and there's a giant screen like a drive-in theater and you see a light in the sky. And that light is coming down and you know that that light is going to take you. And that's the only that thing that it. he gave him. And this guy, we thought he was like, we thought he was playing along until mm -hmm. he started to weep. To cry. and Because be the extraterrestrials, he could see them behind a, a kind of a, like an opaque uh, door. And they did not look like gray aliens. They looked like they didn't have bones. They were kind of like octopus type things. And he Whoa. knew that they... This is the part where it got weird and it changed my mind about what hypnosis is actually doing. He, he said they were aware yeah. that he wasn't supposed to be there and he was telling us things we weren't supposed to know. And then the hypnotist like looks at me and goes, I'm, a, you know, should I have the wall come down so he can describe these things? And we're like, well, fuck yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Pulls the wall down. Guy almost has a nervous breakdown, says they're coming to me. They know what I'm doing. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. So he pulls him out. There were people in that field with him when he came back. There was a girl missing from that field. So there's a part of him that's like gone. He had night terrors for the rest of the trip. It was actually the the experiment that broke the project. Yeah. Because we... everybody got too nervous about what was happening. Yeah. And he had night terrors constantly about alien abduction experiences. And then he started seeing UFOs. Yeah. And he also the the other interesting thing is he has no memory of the actual hypnosis experience at all. So he doesn't remember any aspect of it. He doesn't remember what happened, the scenario, his experience, the things that he like went through. It's completely gone. But all, and, all and, and, and when you tell him, like, you know, you didn't used to believe in aliens, right? He's like, what? Yeah. He's, he's like, he's, no, they are absolutely real. Like, I've seen them. Like, he's seen UFOs in the sky. He sent us mm -hmm. images of these things. He's had his own. Yeah. Experiences. We wow. show the original experiment in season two of Hellier, and then we recreate it mm -hmm. a little bit differently as a way to kind of pull valuable information that no one should know mm. out of the ether and use that in the case. And it worked. It worked. We sent Carl Pfeiffer, our director, because he's sort of the eyes of the audience. And he right. started giving us premonitions of things we wouldn't see or know about until the following day. Yeah. Like very, very distinct descriptions of places images that that would be like just in the place that we would be going to we didn't even know we were going to that place the next day it just happened that yeah. you know someone was like come and meet us here and a lot of the things that he had talked about <laughs> the same thing happened and we also tried it with connor our friend connor who also and it's not in, in hellier but we have the footage who also had his own really really unique experience and very weird things have come out of that interesting uh, also did it change your perspective both on hypnosis and what it's doing to the brain and also on alien abductions. Like does, yeah. like to me, it makes me think that maybe alien abductions are more of like the astral body being taken. Bingo, mm -hmm. bingo. 
I think that when you when you talk to there are experiencers and abductees who believe that they're physically being t- removed and taken. But when mm-hmm. you talk to most people who have consider themselves experiencers and who are having these strange experiences, I think a lot of them understand that it is happening on that astral level, that there's something it, it isn't necessarily maybe their physical bodies that are being taken, but they feel as if they're aspects of themselves that are being kind of removed. But yeah. it's it's pretty common when you when you really start to kind of talk to people about it, their experiences are often very astral. And it's given us context for like classic cases where yeah, hypnosis yeah. has been used. So yeah. for example, you know, Betty and Barney Hill, they were really the first widely modern abductees. publicized modern mm-hmm. abduction case. Mm-hmm. You know, they were hypnotized to, to after, yeah. afterwards, after that experience to tell, you know, people what they experienced. The weird thing is, though, is that the guy who got them their hypnotist was a friend who worked for the military. And so I think that hmm. there is a very strong possibility that hypnosis has been used in cases Absolutely. to maybe make people not think they saw what they saw. Maybe they saw military wow. spacecraft or maybe they were, you know, there's a case that happened yeah. in uh, South America a couple years before Betty and Barney, the V.S. Boas case where this man oh, was yeah. abducted and like, you know, had sex with an alien woman and like had all these weird stuff going on to him. And it comes out if you actually look at like what, the US government, the CIA was doing in that part of the country at that time, it's almost conclusively proven that they abducted this guy yeah. and like made him think it was aliens. Yeah. There's information, There's of- declassified stuff. I totally believe that. My own grandfather, he was in the Air Force and they would get one day off if they volunteered for a certain like experiments. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> so to get a four day work week, he was one of the LSD experimentees oh, wow. Wow, that's and they so didn't cool. know for a long time that it would have any psychological or physiological oh effects gosh. on people and so he had been like years later they called him and whoever else was you know still living from the experiments back down to the base to basically like have the debrief to see what effects oh my that gosh. had on them but he was left alone for you know years and years and years before yeah. anyone was like wait a second maybe we should talk to those people <laughs> Maybe he was a Manchurian candidate. He was waiting to be triggered from the no, MK Ultra yeah. experiments oh, he was part scary. of. Scary. That's very scary. <laughs> Honestly, scary. my he's such a homebody. If anyone tried to trigger him to do anything, he'd be like, no. Good, good for him. <laughs> Didn't All work. the hypnosis, nothing would work anymore. He'd be like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> hypnosis is weird. There's a reason that that episode and that experiment is as controversial as yeah. it is. And and I'm a person who believes, you know, very strongly that hypnosis can be abused. Yeah. Uh, frankly, yeah. it's one of these things where it's really crazy that we have such a an exploitable thing mm-hmm. in our brains. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and it's I think it has been exploited. And so we're very careful when we talk about it or when we do it to like set it up and be like, listen, we are doing this. Everybody's on the same page. Yeah, there's, there's, we know what we're doing. We, yeah. We're aware of the risks when we do this. And I think what we're, we're still you know, we still use it. We're still using it in in cases and investigations. Mm-hmm. If you want another test subject for alien hypnosis, I volunteer. Like I, really? I truly, after hearing that story, I mean, Sabrina truly, like horribly wants it. Yeah, the hypno, we, the uh, hypnotist well, won't. He won't do it again. We we he like won't. Even, that's that's you no. Know, I mean, but. We know how to hypnotize people now. <laughs> Greg's been practicing. I'll let you two do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's. It'd be very. I, we absolutely would. I would. I would urge caution to people who want to do this type of stuff because we don't really know exactly how hypnosis works, yeah, and right. we don't know exactly what it's doing to our minds. And there is an element there where it's like. But I trust you too. <laughs> 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 that doesn't mean we know what we're doing. No, I, I know. Really but turn the lights off. Neither <laughs> do I, right? <laughs> You're two people that I would like to not know what I'm doing with. That is the kindest compliment that anyone's is, ever given that's us. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think because the first experience that we had with Jason, our friend Jason, and his that hypnosis experiment was very kind of frightening for us, for him. And and in recent years, we've like, everyone's gotten to a good place with it. And I think at this point, we've done it enough in in certain ways that we've sort of figured out how to do it in a safe way as we feel kind of comfortable. Does that make sense? Like, I think that if we were to look at the very first time we did it, there was very much like a sort of shit your pants and dive in sort of thing where we're like, let's just see what happens. At this point now, we're like, we kind of have, we have lots of bumpers in place so that no one's, you know, hitting the wall too hard. You learned. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We learned. Exactly. 
Okay, so while Sabrina may or may not convince you to hypnotize her, <laughs> one of your, well, I learned this in your first season of Hellier, that you guys, when you first went Bigfoot hunting, you didn't really <laughs> entirely believe and you thought it was going to be kind of silly and like maybe you'd make fun of it. Uh-huh. But then things started happening. Yeah. And then, you know, just in the past couple of years, you took Jeff Goldblum <laughs> Bigfoot hunting. We did. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was how do you even say that sentence out loud and it be real? It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> yeah. We started, so Greg, back in 2005, he looked it, in the weekly world news. There was a guy in his very rural area. I was in the grocery area. store. Yeah. In my tiny little town of yeah. Troy, Pennsylvania. Very rural town in Pennsylvania. And I love the weekly world news. I'm sad it's not in the grocery store line anymore. Yeah. And I picked it up. And you know, you know it's all fake. But in the back, Bat they have boy. classified ads. And I saw a classified ad for the Elmira Bigfoot watch. And Ooh. I was like, well, Myra's 20 minutes away from yeah. here. This There's a phone number here, mm-hmm. but there's also an address. And so, like, we got our friends together and we went to the address. And it's in, like, a high-rise building with, like, doctors and lawyers office. and therapists. And then there's the Elmira Bigfoot watch. And we no went way. up. <laughs> and we get, we get to the door and I hear, who? Yes. What? <laughs> and I realized this guy's watching a Bruce Lee film. In this thing, (laughs) this is like later in the day and we like look at each other and we're like, oh my God, what are we going to expect here? Yeah. And I was like, well, fuck it. We knocked on the door. (laughs) He opens the door and this giant guy, he immediately, his face lights up and you can tell immediately, oh, he's living in this room. Like this, (laughs) he's just renting this like business. He's got a cot there. He's like got a little cook plate and there's a giant map of Bigfoot sightings on the wall in crayon. (laughs) <laughs> so good and classic, i classic was like here we go and he's like i know you you're the ghost hunters come on in and we went on a big we planned a bigfoot hunt with this guy he handed a bunch of kids loaded oh, guns he literally did so Jesus. this is the origin of where how bigfoot kind of came into our lives <laughs> was with this this man who took Greg at a very Greg and his very young friends into the woods with loaded weapons like a grenade. He gave him a grenade. <laughs> he like grenades. He literally, it's the scariest thing you could possibly imagine. I cannot believe no one got injured. I can't believe it either. Some uh, it's incredible that no one was hurt. Long story short, yes. I'll say there's a I made an hour long documentary. It's very cute and very funny. That is not available anywhere. I'll send it we'll to you guys it. if you want to so watch great. it. It's so great. Please. Um, oh, uh, of, I do. Of those initial investigations. He told us like you've got Five shots. Ugh. Save the last one for yourself if you don't kill it. And big Bigfoot's like just gonna crazy it- stuff like that to tell kids. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> but oh my god, we had an experience and we found Bigfoot tracks and we all like looked at each other like, holy shit! Mm-hmm. Maybe this like insane guy is onto something. Yeah, and it sort of became this really interesting road where. We've gone out in the field with so many different types of Bigfoot investigators and that all different kinds of walks of life from the initial guy who had guns and wanted to shoot it to later on, you know, we've met uh, a set of Bigfoot investigators. Their names were Dallas and Wayne, and they had a very different approach to Bigfoot. It was very kind of new agey. And so we wanted to kind of have all those different types of experiences. Mm -hmm. But what we realized is that regardless of the experience, oftentimes we were having strange paranormal experiences paranormal, yeah, like around Bigfoot sightings. Around Bigfoot sightings. So it, right. with every time we would go out into the field with one of these people, I think initially we wanted it to be silly. And then we were all like by, you know, two in the morning <laughs> hiding in the car while like beasts scream, scream out of the woods. And you're just like, this is not real. Like, how is this real? We did an episode of Finding Bigfoot. We did. With the Finding Bigfoot guys because they would not touch like supernatural sightings with yeah. a 10 foot pole. They're like, no, it's an undiscovered primate. They did the woo-woo stuff we don't get down with. And I tell you what, it couldn't have worked better because yeah. we were in the field with them. Yeah. And we were in a place that was supposed to be haunted. And there were Bigfoot sightings there. What was it? Jackass Springs, I mm-hmm. think it was called. We were in we got California. To, we were in Mount Shasta for two weeks. And Shasta is a really interesting place because there are tons and tons of cryptid and UFO and Bigfoot sightings. But like Greg said, they tend to be weirder. And often when you Mm. talk to a lot of Bigfoot and cryptozoologists, they're very much a flesh and blood creature. They don't really like it when you bring paranormal things into it. But the weirdest part is the more you dig into Bigfoot, the more you realize that a majority, if not more than the other cases, have these very strange paranormal elements. So Bigfoot appears Mm. and disappears. Footprints appear and disappear. 
they believe they're coming out of portals. And Shasta is this place where a lot of that really, really, really weird stuff is sort of contained um, within that the mountain. Right. During that shoot, all of the electronics fried. Yeah. And the Finding Bigfoot guys are like, nothing has ever happened in like 10 seasons of this show that has never happened before. And I, we were like, wow. well, that happens you, to ghost hunters all the time. We can tell you what's happening. Right. If you yeah. just listen, we, we, <laughs> yeah, that's why you brought us they here. They know what that, we know what that is. So then when we got invited by Disney to do an investigation of Bigfoot with Jeff Goldblum, we're very upfront and honest with these people where I was like, listen, <laughs> we are not normal Bigfoot hunters. Yeah. Like, we don't we, have hats. We don't have the cool We don't have the hats, Bigfoot hats. And the, we can't the, track <laughs> footprints or anything. I'm not going to like, you know, smell, yeah. you know, uh, no, feces and know that it's from blowing. a Bigfoot. Yeah. And they were like, no, no, no. That's why we want you guys to take Jeff yeah. out. Like, we want you to have a fun time. Mm -hmm. And so we had the ire of every Bigfoot hunting organization <laughs> yeah. on us yeah. as we were taking I'm the, sure. the, the <laughs> most beloved celebrities yeah, someone into the woods to tell them Bigfoot's probably a ghost. <laughs> 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 it was incredible we they brought us so we we were filming in the redwoods and a lot of bigfoot sightings in the redwood forest they didn't want us to meet jeff before filming because they wanted to get your natural reaction because he's right. like a magical being so they just led us into the redwoods and they were like just wait here and you'll see the camera crew coming so greg and i are standing on like a three thousand year old tree just in the middle of this place it doesn't feel real and we start like hearing a voice and off in the distance, it's just it's just Jeff Goldblum, and he's walking towards us. And he was like, "What's more paranormal here?" I I literally Jeff Goldblum. It's as rare. It's as rare as Bigfoot <laughs> sighting is to see Jeff Goldblum like walking through. <laughs> and he was so into it, and he was he, he wanted to have the experience, and he leaned in. And I love that he looked into the dark mirror. Like he there's did. a whole bunch of stuff that didn't make it into the love episode. That. Yeah, that footage is probably Because I think it was a little, it got a little too real. Yeah. And mm -hmm. one of the mandates from Disney was we couldn't say that Bigfoot exists. We couldn't say it's real. Mm -hmm. Everything mm -hmm. had to be possibility. And so we brought a bunch of objects with us too. He looked into the dark mirror and he saw his deceased brother. Yeah. And he started crying. And like the <gasps> crew was all very affected. It was mm -hmm. wild. Oh my God. So there, it wow. was a really weird oh. shoot. Still the weirdest thing I think we've ever done mm -hmm. is hang out with Jeff Goldblum. Man, now I'm regretting not fully looking into the dark mirror because I crossed my eyes during it because I was scared. We can make that happen. We, we could still do it because yeah. we also were both too scared that we ended up looking at it at the same time, which I think impacted. <laughs> you did. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> we didn't really experience it properly. Yeah. And you were also in the conjuring house for the first it's hard when you've got like you're just so stimulated out, yeah. yeah you're like oh i don't know yeah. what to do yeah but we'll make that happen for sure okay i feel like there's a lot of things that we want to do with you now we <laughs> <laughs> can we just follow you around let's go oh, anytime anytime can we live with you yes. we'll be a part of the museum <laughs> share your location and then don't be surprised <laughs> if we show up Come on down. <laughs> well, well, now we've been given the approval of light stalking, so we are just going to show up. That's right. There you go. There you That's go. right. We are, we'll enable your light stalking. We'll give you guys <laughs> access to the ring cameras. You can, you can watch us. <laughs> It'll <Perfect>. be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. We have so much fun with you guys. Oh, you guys are the <laughs> best. I'm so glad that you're finally on because it's been, not to sound too obsessed with you, but- Oh, stop. We are though. It's been like, years and years of us referencing you guys at least man once a month <laughs> i love you guys we have no idea who we are at all mm. like we we just greg and i we're so focused on like investigating and and like keeping in this space as much as we possibly can that we like forget we to ever, pop our heads yeah. up every once in a while so it's good for us to be like oh hi hi everybody like we just forget the fact that you responded to our inquiry about going to the conjuring house with us and that you didn't know who we were before that. And you're just like, hell yeah, we'll, we'll go to a house with strangers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Haunted sleepover with two random girls. Sounds great. Dude, Let's we had it. so much fun. Mm -hmm. It was so great. It was so much fun. We would love to do it again. We'll do it again. Yes, we absolutely yeah. will. Well, you guys have an incredible podcast and you have an incredible Patreon. Do you want to talk really quickly about those two? Yeah. Well, thanks for letting us plug it. Thanks. We uh, we have. <laughs> well, also we're pa we're Patreon members. <laughs> are you really? <laughs> yeah, we, we listen are. to your podcast and we're Patreon members. Oh no way! Oh, gosh, 
I love you guys. You guys are so amazing. Oh. <laughs> we love you. It's the light stocking has already started. You guys just didn't know. God. I love it. <laughs> I'm into it, apparently. It's my thing. <laughs> we have a seasonal podcast that we do we called do. the Haunted Objects Podcast. And every episode, we pick an item from the collection. Mm -hmm. We have a very broad definition of, of haunted. We, we consider anything in the collection that has a, a story attached to it that can affect people as haunted. Mm -hmm. And so... Everything from, you know, UFO crash parts to yeah. pieces of Betty Hill's dress, you know, from her the night she was abducted, haunted objects that, you know, seem like classic objects, dolls, things like that. We try to do as much of a deep. We have an incredible producer, our producer, Connor Randall, and we have lots of other people. And our researcher, Keelan, Keelan Matthews. Matthews. And so we get to kind of collectively nerd out and really like go so, so deep into the lore and the history and it's great because Connor, our producer, is so good at kind of bringing in all of the elements of each one of the objects so that we can get like such a good full round kind of view of it. We try to do as much of a deep dive into the objects as we can. And we try to pick things that are really wide and kind of across the board. We're working on season two right now. We are. We're, we're hoping to make an announcement very soon. Mm -hmm. Season two is going to be even better than season one. Yeah. But uh, if you can find it on anywhere you listen and it's a kind of a video forward podcast yeah. so we did you... a i always laugh because we have the audio option but we have a video option to watch we did an episode on we have a lot of haunted clowns unsurprisingly <gasps> lots of porcelain clowns wait 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 oh god is there one back there we so we did an episode on haunted clowns but as far as the video goes we all dressed in head-to-toe clown makeup but we oh didn't reference gosh. it ever we didn't reference it at all <laughs> That's so incredible. Greg was Pennywise. It's horrifying. Our producer Connor was like hot Jared Leto. Like it was incredible. <laughs> but there are so many. Yeah, here it is. There you go. Can you already hear like the weird Are noises? they jingling in there? Yeah. I heard, I heard jingling sounds. We are sent. I did hear like music. Yeah. More than any other object people send us. People yeah. send us porcelain clowns or like clown dolls for obvious reasons. Yeah, they're creepy. Yeah, we have. This, here you go. An entire box. <laughs> Porcelain clown. Go ahead. Ready? Open it up. <gasps> it's it's oh! real. These are They're all haunted old. clowns. You want haunted clown SMR? Oh. ASMR? Oh my God. <laughs> There's wow. a lot. Have you guys been to the clown motel? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring your porcelain clowns? We did. Have you guys been to the clown motel? That's what we no. do. That's where we should That's go. That's what we should do. We'll, go to, the we'll go to the clown motel, and then it's like an hour drive to Area 51. Oh, fuck yeah. That's, let's, okay. let's That's take a road what we trip. should do. I would love that. It is, imagine people for 50 years going to a creepy motel and, <laughs> and putting creepy clown energy into the motel, and it's like, if we are capable of creating thought forms that can interact with us collectively, it is a, a motel full of horrifying caricature thought form clowns that do the weird, like people have the weirdest, darkest, creepiest experiences there. But oh my gosh. When you kind of come at it from that perspective, you have like, it's a weird thing to explore. It's a very weird okay. look into the, the fear of clowns so much fun though let's do it i'm excited now i really okay. want to do this we have to make it happen done we did an investigation we there. did yeah and, you know funny story we uploaded the investigation we do these live investigations for patreon yeah we do there you go so if Good you segue. want to take part in it patreon.com slash paramuseum <laughs> there you go there's That's the plug good. you did a good plug thank you Amazing. Thank you both for joining us. This is so fun. As always, it's so fun to talk to you too. Anytime. Anytime. You guys are the best. You are. And, thank and, you and so much for everything. Thank you for including us in your tour. Yeah. It was really cool. Of course. So yeah. many people told us a lot of the stops they were like, we we went and saw it. And it was so wonderful. It was just like, it felt like a cool community of people kind of all supporting. Yeah. You guys creators. have a really cool community. You really, really do. We love Aww, them. Thank yeah. Thank you. Well, it wouldn't have been the same without you guys. And yeah, you've taught us so much. I feel like this mm -hmm. past year, we feel like we're more confidently treading forward and almost you guys were almost like a launching pad for us to yeah. have the confidence to real life. Like it's one thing to talk about it in your own home behind a microphone. Yeah, it's sure. a whole other thing to actually go into the place. So you guys have built our confidence a little bit in that category. So thank you. We got more, more adventures to go on. We do. Too. Yes. Stay tuned. <laughs> Do you want to do our sign off with us? So we do like a whispered see you on the other side very slowly. Yeah. Do you want to do it with us? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's slower than you think it will be. Okay. We will see you.
on the other side.